Hello and welcome to the Sunday edition of Daily News Simplified. Today we have taken the important articles from Indian Express and The Hindu and curated as per the demands of civil services examination. The topics for today's discussion are mentioned over your screen. So let's begin our session. The first topic for today's discussion is based on this particular article which appeared on Indian Express dated 19 June 2023. The context of the article is that, in the recent judgment, the Delhi High Court has stated that the right to identity is an intrinsic part of the right to life under Article 21. And the Allahabad High Court has observed that the right to keep a name of one's choice or to change the name according to personal preference is vested in every citizen under Article 91A, subsection A, Article 21 and Article 14 of Indian Constitution. Hence, the High Courts have maintained that the right to change one's name or surname is a part of right to life under Article 21. If we talk about Article 21, it is the right to life in personal liberty. The right to life in personal liberty under this article is not latent. The ambit of this right has been expanding due to judicial activism and various interpretation given by the Supreme Court. So in today's discussion, we are going to know about Article 21, Right to Life and Personal Liberty, the expansion of the ambit of Article 21 through important cases, and we will also see if Right to Life and Personal Liberty is an absolute right. This topic is important for our GS Paper 2, Polity and Governance. Under the syllabus head, Indian Constitution, Historical Underpinnings, Evolution, Features, Amendments, Significant Provisions and Basic Structure. UPSC in 2015 in the mains examination had asked this particular question which was regarding the right to clean environment and it is one of the interpretation of article 21. Also in the year 2017 we found this question which was regarding the right to privacy. So right to privacy is also an intrinsic part of right to life and personal liberty. And in the prelims examination in the year 2018 we found this particular question regarding the right to privacy. And in 2019, we found this question which was regarding the right to marry the person of one's choice. So part third of the Indian constitution deal with the fundamental rights. They cover the articles from article 12 to article 35. Right to life and personal liberty is a fundamental right which is guaranteed by the article 21 of Indian constitution. So this article 21 provides two primary rights. These are the right to life and the right to personal liberty. And this right in India is accessible to every person, whether or not they are the nationals of India. That is, it is available to both citizens and non-citizens. And Article 21 remains enforceable even during the times of emergency. So this Article 21 is not latent, rather an evolving section of the legislation. And over the years, through judicial activism and through various Supreme Court interpretations, the ambit of Article 21 has widened. And to understand this, let us see two landmark cases. The first case is A.K. Gopalan versus the State of Madras of 1950. In this case, the Supreme Court has given a narrow interpretation of the Article 21. So in this narrow interpretation, the Supreme Court has held that the protection provided under Article 21 is available only against the arbitrary executive action and not against the arbitrary legislative action. So this means that in case the law of the land happens to be arbitrary but it is following the procedure established by the law, then the validity of that law cannot be questioned on the ground that the law is unreasonable, unfair or unjust. Hence, the state can deprive the right to life and personal liberty of a person based on any law. Also in this case, the personal liberty means only the liberty related to the person or body of the individual. Now let us see the another landmark case, Menka Gandhi vs. Union of India 1978 that widened the interpretation of Article 21. So in the Menka Gandhi case, Supreme Court overruled its judgment in the Gopalan case and took a wider interpretation of Article 21. So in this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the right to life and personal liberty of an individual can be deprived by any law. But such law must not be unfair, unreasonable or arbitrary. 
So the case established that the protection under Article 21 is available not only against the arbitrary executive action but also against the arbitrary legislative action. Also, in this case, the Supreme Court held that the right to life under Article 21 does not mean the mere animal existence or the mere bodily existence. But this also covers the right to live with human dignity and covers all those aspects which makes a man's life meaningful, complete and worth living. Hence, over the time, the interpretation of Article 21 has become more liberal and now it includes certain more rights. So this is the list of rights which is included under Article 21. Some of the important rights are right to live with human dignity, right to a decent environment including pollution-free water and air, and protection against hazardous industries, right to livelihood, right to privacy, right to health, right to free education and free legal aid, right to livelihood among others. So regarding the wider interpretation of Article 21, let us see some important cases. The first case is Olga Telles versus Bombay Municipal Corporation 1985. So this case was related to providing alternate arrangement to the slum dwellers. And in this case, the Supreme Court has held that the right to livelihood is an essential part of the right to life. Another important case is Vishakha versus the State of Rajasthan 1997. So this was the case which addressed the issue of sexual harassment of women in workplace. And in this case, the Supreme Court recognized that the right to life also includes the right to live with dignity. And in this case, the Supreme Court laid down the Vishakha guidelines which were to address sexual harassment at workplaces. Another important case is Justice K.S. Puttaswamy vs. Union of India 2017. So this was the case which questions the Aadhaar scheme of the central government as a contravention to the right to privacy. And in this judgment, the Supreme Court recognized that right to privacy is an important part of right to life conferred by the Article 21. While the case supported the constitutional legality of the Aadhaar card, but it also stuck down some provisions related to the Aadhaar Act 2016, recognizing that right to privacy is an important part and covered the right to keep private information as a secret. So Article 14 of Indian Constitution, Article 19 and Article 21. Together, these three articles are referred to as Golden Triangle. Article 14 guarantees the right to equality before law and equal protection of laws. Article 19 is related to the several fundamental freedoms given to the citizen of India. So in the Menka Gandhi case, the Supreme Court established the connection between Article 14, 19 and 21 and stated that any law which takes away the personal liberty of any person will also deprive the person of his right to equality under Article 14 and will also deprive him from the right to freedom under Article 19. Hence, these rights are interconnected and provide a safeguard against the unreasonable actions of the government. Now let's see, is the right to life and personal liberty an absolute right? Article 21 says that no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except according to the procedure established by law. So as we read earlier, the most critical aspect of the Menaka Gandhi case is the reinterpretation of this term, procedure established by the law. So this means that the right to life and personal liberty under Article 21 is not an absolute right and any person can be deprived of his life or personal liberty by the way of procedure established by law. But any such procedure for the restriction on this right must be reasonable, proportionate and in accordance with the principles of natural justice. For example, in the case of capital punishment, the state is empowered to take away the life of citizens through a procedure established by law. But for that, the Indian Penal Code under the Section 302 provides the reason for that penalty and the Criminal Procedure Code established the process of awarding this death penalty. So, capital punishment or providing death penalty is not against the principles of Article 21. So, having understood Article 21, there is a practice question for you which you can attempt. The question is, trace the evolution of the concept of due process of law in India and explain how it is different from the procedure established by law. 
The next topic for today's discussion is based on this article which appeared on the Indian Express dated June 22. The context of this article is that recently the central government has withdrawn the draft livestock and livestock products importation and exportation bill 2023. So proceeding in this article we will discuss in brief what is this issue all about and then we will focus to an important dimension for our UPSC examination which is livestock rearing. In this article we will discuss the status of livestock in India what is the significance of livestock for farmers the challenges faced in this sector the government scheme and the way forward so this topic is important for us for our gs paper 3 economy under the syllabus head economics of animal rearing in the year 2015 we found this question which was regarding the potential of livestock rearing for providing non farm employment and income in rural areas in the year 2019 we found this question which was regarding the integrated farming system of which the livestock rearing is an important component in the year 2022 we found this question which was regarding the challenges and opportunities of food processing sector in the country and how the income of farmers can be substantially increased by encouraging food processing Now a question on the similar lines can be asked regarding the livestock rearing that what are the challenges and opportunities of livestock rearing for the country and how the incomes of the farmers can be increased by implementing the integrated farming system or by enhancing the livestock rearing so recently amid heavy criticism the central government has withdrawn the draft livestock and livestock products importation and exportation bill 2023 This bill was aimed to replace the Livestock Importation Act of 1898 and the Livestock Amendment Act of 2001. The bill was prepared by the Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairying which comes under the Ministry of Fisheries Animal Husbandry and Dairying. So let us see what was the need for this bill. The bill was needed to align the provisions of the 125 year old act with the present or the contemporary requirements related to the sanitary and phytosanitary measures sanitary and phytosanitary measures are the regulations which are used in the context of international trade to ensure the safety of food animal products plants being traded between the countries so in order to ensure the compliance to these measures there was a need to amend this bill let's see what were the provisions of the proposed draft bill the earlier law only regulated the imports of livestock but the proposed draft bill also had the provisions to regulate the livestock exports and the major issue here was that the draft bill had the provision for the export of live animals so as per the definition of 1898 act the livestock included horses kine which are cows and any other animal which may be specified by the central government by notification in the official gazette so this draft bill expanded the definition of livestock as per the new definition it also included felines and canines and this bill took away some powers of the state government so the major criticism regarding this bill was from the animal right groups which said that this export of live animals including the felines and canines will open up pandora's box for cruelty on animals and allowing the live export of these animals will give a blanket pass for the abuse of these animals for food or any other purpose So let us see the another dimension which is livestock rearing. Livestock plays an important role in the Indian economy. As per the latest livestock census which was in the year 2019, India is the world's largest livestock owner with more than 535 million livestock. The importance of this sector can be gauged from the fact that livestock sector contributes to more than 4% of Indian GDP. and it contributes to more than 25% of total agricultural gdp the sector provides employment to more than 8% of indian population majority of which are residing in rural areas and as per the estimates of national account statistics 2020 the contribution of livestock in total agriculture and allied sector gross value added has increased to 29.35% in the year 2019-2020 from around 24% in the year 2014-2015 so let us quickly see what is the role of livestock in farmers economy 
The first important role is that livestock provides a valuable source of food including meat, eggs, fish which caters to the nutritional needs of the Indian households and food security. The another important role is it provides income to the farmers and landless laborers. We know that the majority of Indian population is still engaged in agriculture for their livelihoods. But as agriculture is seasonal in nature, livestock rearing provides alternate employment to farmers. And also the landless laborers can depend on livestock in the lean agricultural season. Another important role is providing fiber and skin. Livestock such as sheep and goats are raised for wool and skin, which can be used for various purposes. Wool can be used for textiles and skins can be used for leather production. And this can support the cottage industries and can provide an additional income source to the farmers. Another important role of livestock is draft. This is in the rural areas where mechanized farming is not prevalent. Livestock, particularly bullocks, they are used for the draft purposes. That is, they are employed to plow fields, also for transportation and perform any other agricultural activities and thus reducing the dependence on manual labor and increasing the productivity. Livestock waste can be used as bio manure, which is a valuable source of organic fertilizer and this can be used to enrich the soil, improve crop productivity and reduce the dependence on chemical fertilizers and thereby promoting the sustainable farming practices. Finally, the livestock can also be used as emergency resource. So in the case of emergency situations like in the case of crop failure or natural disasters, farmer can sell or slaughter livestock to meet their immediate financial needs or to sustain themselves during these difficult times. Now let us see what are the challenges faced by the livestock farming in India, which is hindering its potential and impacting the agricultural economy. The first challenge is poor milk yield. Despite having a large livestock population in India, the average milk yield per animal is relatively low. And this is due to the prevalence of indigenous breeds which have low genetic potential. The milk yielding potential of indigenous breeds of Indian cattle is comparatively low as compared to the exotic breeds. And this limits the overall productivity and profitability of the dairy farming. Another issue is livestock rearing is highly neglected as an industry. In India, livestock rearing is generally considered a subsidiary to the agriculture. So this leads to insufficient attention, insufficient investment, or impacts the development of livestock sector as an independent industry. Another issue is the scarcity of grassland or fodders in India. So in India, the availability of grassland for livestock grazing is limited. And further, the green spaces have been shrinking due to rapid urbanization and shrinking land sizes. And this has led to lower area for green fodder production. And as a result, the farmers are forced to feed their cattle dry fodder or agricultural waste and which is often less nutritious and this also affects the overall health and milk productivity of the animals. Another important issue is the risk of communicable diseases in cattle. In the recent time there has been increase in the communicable diseases among the animals. So there is a prevalence of the livestock diseases such as foot and mouth disease, lumpy skin disease, tick borne diseases and which are causing the fatality of the cattle. And this fatality of the cattle is even increased due to ineffective veterinary and extension services in India. In India, the provisions of veterinary services such as timely vaccinations, healthcare and technical guidance is often inadequate. Another important challenge is the limitations of artificial insemination. The promotion of exotic breeds in India through artificial insemination has led to the neglect of indigenous breeds and this has resulted to the loss of genetic diversity and the potential benefits of indigenous livestock. For example, the indigenous breeds often adjust to the adverse climate conditions. They can adjust to the scarcity of food and are resistant to the diseases peculiar to the region where they are evolved. But compared to the indigenous breed, the exotic breed or the foreign breed 
is only productive in the ideal disease free condition but in the long run they are more impacted by the climatic conditions diseases spread and are not economically valuable another important issue is lack of cold storage facilities in india so in india there is an absence of sufficient cold storage facilities for storing milk or dairy products or meat and meat products and additionally due to the lack of forward and backward linkages like efficient transportation or marketing channels logistics issue it creates a challenge in reaching the market effectively and hence this issue has hampered the development of dairy as an industry finally there is a lack of credit for raising livestock and this lack of financial support or credit facilities restrict their investment and expansion of livestock so in order to address these challenges these are some government initiatives one important initiative is national livestock mission the mission was launched in the year 2014 and it aims to ensure holistic development of the livestock so under the holistic development it focuses on improving the productivity of the livestock enhancing the availability and quality of the fodder it focuses on breed improvement and strengthening disease control and capacity building of the farmers another important initiative is rashtriya gokul mission so this initiative aims to conserve and develop the indigenous breeds of cattle and buffaloes which have better adaptability to the local conditions and can play a crucial role in the livelihood of farmers another important initiative is national animal disease control program this is a central sector scheme which was launched by the government in the year 2019 for the control of foot and mouth disease which is a viral disease in cattle and for the control of brucellosis which is a bacterial disease in cattle so this will be done by 100% vaccination of the cattle buffalo sheep goat and pig population for these diseases the aim is eventual eradication of foot and mouth disease by the year 2030 So another important initiative is e pashu heart portal. So this is a portal between the breeders and farmers regarding the quality bovine germplasm. The next is dairy entrepreneurship development scheme. This scheme is implemented by the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development and provides financial support to the entrepreneurs and farmers for establishing modern dairy farms and developing dairy infrastructure. The next initiative is Animal Husbandry Infrastructure Development Fund. This fund has been launched in the year 2020 under the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan Stimulus Package. It is a fund worth 15000 crore rupees which is to incentivize individual entrepreneurs, private companies, MSMEs, farmers producer organizations. This is to establish infrastructure for dairy processing, meat and meat products processing. and establishment of feed manufacturing unit another scheme is national livestock insurance scheme so this scheme provides insurance coverage to the livestock against natural disasters diseases or accidents it helps the farmers to mitigate the financial risk which are associated with livestock farming and ensures their economic stability in case of livestock losses Another initiative is Kamdhenu Yojana which was launched in the year 2019 and this also aims in promoting sustainable dairy farming by providing financial assistance to set up dairy units breed improvement and enhancing milk productivity Finally the government has initiated various programs to promote the cultivation and availability of quality fodder So in the way forward we can say that the first important step in the livestock rearing sector is to ensure fodder security fodder security means to ensure adequate and sustainable supply of quality fodder and this will ensure livestock health and productivity and for it the effort should be to improve the forage varieties or the variety of fodder crops and to establish fodder banks to address the seasonal variations and scarcity of fodder the next step can be genetic surveillance For this there should be a regular monitoring and surveillance of livestock diseases. This will ensure early detection, prevention and control of outbreaks and will safeguard the health and productivity of the livestock. 
the next step can be creating a unified livestock market to strengthen the industry farmer linkages for example creating more industry farmer linkages like amul and this will lead to the commercialization of livestock production and provide the farmers with additional income security another step can be to establish indigenous breed gene banks setting up gene banks for the indigenous cattle will preserve their genetic diversity and this can help in long term conservation and utilization of indigenous breeds another step can be by introducing veterinary ambulance services and compulsory livestock vaccination this compulsory livestock vaccination can help control and prevent the spread of diseases further for the commercialization of livestock sector the focus should be on capacity building and skill development of the farmers and finally the government should prioritize one health approach one health approach recognizes the interconnectedness between the human plant and animal health and this is important for the sustainable development of livestock sector and this is also important to protect humans from any future outbreak of zoonotic diseases the next topic for today's discussion is based on this article which appeared on indian express on 23rd june now this article says that the headline retail inflation rate has fallen to a 25 month low in may 2023 but this has been due to a high base rate so on the right hand side you can see a chart which reflects the consumer price index inflation so in this chart various color reflects various categories like the green line reflects the prices of spices and if we compare the price of spices from april 2022 to may 2023 this price has risen which reflects a high consumer price inflation and similarly there is a high inflation trend in the price of other food and household items so this article says that the retail inflation rate in india has fallen to a 25 month low in may 2023 but this is due to a high base rate however the inflation in food and household items still remain high and which is reflected in this chart now let us proceed further to have a better understanding of these terms like what is inflation what are the kinds of inflation what is headline inflation and what is base rate what is consumer price inflation among others inflation is one of the important topics in economy regarding which upsc has asked questions multiple times in the prelims examination we can find this questions in the year 2015 in the year 2020 in 2021 again in 2021 so what is inflation inflation refers to the sustained rise in the general level of prices over a period of time in the economy that is when there is a rise in the price of any goods or services over a period of time in the economy we say that the price of that good or service is inflated and because of which there is a fall in the value of money that is the purchasing power of money decreases due to inflation based on origin inflation can be classified into two types the first type is cost push inflation this is caused by the rise in the prices of factors of production such as the increased cost of raw materials electricity rent labor and because of which the cost of production increases so one example can be when the global crude oil price increases its effect is translated by increase in the prices of related goods and services the other kind of inflation is demand pull inflation this occurs when the demand increases due to excess money supply with the people without the increase in supply level of goods or services so this kind of inflation is caused when the supply of goods and services is limited but the demand is more inflation is measured using price index that is the change in average price level over a period of time for it india uses two types of price index the first such type is wholesale price index and the other type is consumer price index wholesale price index is used to measure the changes occurring in the prices of goods in the wholesale market so wholesale price index measures the first stage or the initial stage of transaction and the wholesale price index covers only the prices of goods consumer price index measures the price of goods and services that the consumers have to pay at the retail level 
so the consumer price index traces the final stage of any transaction because it is the retail price a consumer is paying for any goods or service consumer price index covers both goods and services wholesale price index is calculated by the office of economic advisor which is under the ministry of commerce and industry whereas cpi is calculated by the national statistical office which is under the ministry of statistics and program implementation presently the base year for calculation of wpi is 2011-12 and the base year for the calculation of cpi is 2012 now let us understand what is headline and core inflation so what is headline inflation it is the inflation in consumer price index or wholesale price index covering all categories of goods and services or in the simple words we can say headline inflation is the measure of total inflation in any economy and what is core inflation it is the non fuel and non food segment of inflation so core inflation excludes the volatile categories such as food and fuel hence the high fluctuation in the prices of food and fuel will impact the headline inflation but they will not impact the core inflation so what is base effect in the context of inflation base effect means the distortion in the year on year inflation rate which is caused by a low or a high base year so let us consider this example for example the price of any commodity is rupees 100 in june 2021 say after a year the price of that commodity is rupees 150 so if we consider june 2021 as our base year then there is 50% inflation in june 2022 now say in june 2023 the price of that commodity is 200 rupees so if we keep june 2021 as our base year then the inflation rate is 100% but if we keep june 2022 as our base year then the inflation rate is 33.33% so this distortion in the inflation rate is known as base effect So in this example the inflation rate in 2023 is 33.33% and the inflation rate in 2022 is 50%. So the inflation rate in 2023 fell. But this was because of a high base effect. So similarly the news article says that the headline retail inflation rate has fallen to a 25 month low in May 2023 because of a high base rate. But despite this there is a no relief to consumers. as there is a high inflation in food and household items price the final topic for today's discussion is based on this article which appeared on the page number 14 of today's hindu the context of the article is that recently united state of america has given approval to cultivate laboratory grown meat or cell cultivated meat for human consumption as the name itself implies the meat is grown in laboratory Now this topic is important for our GS paper 3 science and technology under the syllabus awareness in the field of biotechnology. So in this article we will be discussing what is the process of developing laboratory grown meat. What are the benefits of such meat? What are the challenges associated? Laboratory grown meat or cultivated meat refers to in vitro production of meat from animal cells. In vitro production means any kind of production which is outside the body of an organism so such kind of meat is grown in laboratory under controlled conditions so let us see the production process of the lab grown meat the first step include the isolation of the desired cells which are usually the stem cells from the body of the animal step 2 after the isolation of the stem cells they are kept in a supporting environment or they are kept in a device called bioreactor and in the bioreactor they get the right temperature and some resources are added like nutrients fats carbohydrates amino acids which these cells will require to make more copies of themselves hence in the bioreactor cell differentiation starts and after 2 or 3 weeks lab grown meat is produced and further some additives are added to improve the texture of this meat So what are the benefits of lab grown meat? The first benefit is that the lab grown meats will reduce greenhouse gases emission. Meat industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world. This is because of a large scale emission of carbon dioxide, 
मीथेन एंड वेरियस नाइट्रस ऑक्साइड्स एज पर एन एस्टिमेशन फ्रॉम फूड एंड एग्रीकल्चर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ग्लोबल लाइफ स्टॉक इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर फोर्टीन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ ऑल एंथ्रोपोजेनिक ग्रीन हाउस गैशियस एमिशंस हैंस द लैब ग्रोन मीट विल वास्टली रिड्यूस द इन्वायरमेंट इम्पैक्ट ऑफ ग्लोबल मीट प्रोडक्शन द सेकेंड बेनिफिट इज दैट लैब ग्रोन मीट विल रिक्वायर लेस लैंड फॉर प्रोडक्शन सो एज पर अ रिपोर्ट बाई एफ एओ लैब ग्रोन मीट विल यूज सिक्सटी थ्री परसेंट लेस लैंड एज कम्पेयर टू द ट्रेडिशनल मीट इंडस्ट्रीज फर्दर इट वुड कंज्यूम एटी परसेंट लेस वाटर दैन द कन्वेंशनल मीट इंडस्ट्रीज ऑल्सो इट इज एन अल्टरनेटिव वे टू मीट वर्ड्स न्यूट्रिशनल सिक्योरिटी नीड्स सो दिस काइंड ऑफ मीट ऑल्सो सॉल्व द एथिकल कंसर्नस रिलेटेड टू क्रियोलिटी ऑन एनिमल्स एज सच काइंड ऑफ मीट वुड बी कंपेरेटिवली क्रियोलिटी फ्री द लैब बेस्ड मीट विल बी लेस कंटामिनेटेड एंड विल यूज लेसर एंटीबायोटिक्स सो देर आर लेसर चांसेस ऑफ गेटिंग एनिमल बॉर्न डिजीजेस आफ्टर द कंजम्पन ऑफ सच काइंड ऑफ मीट हावे वर देर आर सम इश्यूज और चैलेंजेस रिलेटेड टू कल्चर्ड मीट द फर्स्ट इश्यू इज कंज्यूमर एक्सेप्टेंस द मेजर चैलेंज विद द लैब ग्रोन मीट इज टू मीट द डिमांड ऑफ ऑरिजिनल टेस्ट टेक्स्चर एंड अपीरियंस ऑफ द कन्वेंशनल मीट and if the lab grown meat fails to meet this demand there will be a less consumer acceptance another issue is high cost of cultivation as of now the lab cultivated meat is more costly as compared to the conventional meat another issue is resource availability for the production of cultured meat a high quality of cells is required and meeting which may be an issue another significant challenge is funding crunch the private players especially in the developing nations like india they are reluctant to provide funds for research and development in cell cultivated meat so in the near future when such kind of challenges are overcome and by more infusion of technology lab based meat can become an alternative to conventional meat